Hey folks, and welcome to another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast. Delighted today to be joined by Rob Volpe. Um, he's an author of the book, Tell Me More About That. It's about empathy. And uh, for me in society and everything we do at the moment in leadership, empathy is one of the common words that we always talk about. And today we'll talk about the five steps that he's got in the book around empathy and how it's a muscle that we need to practice. A fascinating conversation. Um, touching on some of his more recent pieces that he's been suffering in his life, but also some stories in there. So looking forward to hearing what you think about Rob, a brilliant, brilliant guy. Um, and in terms of his background, the value set so much in line with what I believe in. So look forward to hearing your feedback. Welcome to the Leadership Tales podcast. Love you to introduce yourself to the audience who don't know you. I'm delighted to have you on. I've loved our conversation so far, but tell the, the world who you are. Absolutely, Colin. And thank you so much for having me uh, on, on the show. It's great to be here. Um, so yes, so I'm Rob Volpe. I'm the CEO and founder of Ignite360, which is an insights strategy and training firm uh, based out of the United States. So what does that mean? We actually take the time to get to know other people, human beings, consumers, and how um, clients can, you know, which are you know, various brands and different sectors, can use that understanding, that empathy that they develop in order to build better products and services and things. And coming out of that work, um, you know, empathy is, is part and parcel to, to who we are and the work that we do. But we realized that there was a barrier. There were things getting in our clients' way um, to actually reaching empathy, just understanding, you know, where their, their consumers were coming from. And so we started to look at that and identified what we call the five steps to empathy, which is a lot of what our training is based on. And then I ultimately um, wrote a book based off of that called Tell Me More About That, Solving the Empathy Crisis, One Conversation at a Time. And the book um, brings those steps to life, but using my own stories and my own failures, quite honestly, as, as well as some successes. But the times that I was challenged doing my work, going into strangers' homes uh, to build empathy empathy and, and make an empathetic connection with others. So I call myself now an empathy activist as well as I'm helping spread the word about empathy and help people understand it and get more comfortable with it. Um, and doing that one conversation at a time. Love that. And I love the book and I, I love your story from back. So if you're comfortable, I'd love you to share some of the, the journey that got you to this, because there's, there's a bit of the professional side you've hinted at now in terms of there's some great stories about, you know, the interviews and getting to know the interviewee and those, those but there's also this story about you and how you learned. Cause one of the questions that was asked by my team coming on here is can empathy, isn't, is it natural or can it be developed? And my, my understanding is it can be developed from where you're coming from. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, and so, yeah, empathy is actually something that we're all born with, um, but it's something that it, it's the analogy that I like to use now when I'm giving talks uh, around empathy is, you know, when a baby is born, it has the muscles in its legs to ultimately walk and run. However, those muscles have to strengthen up and you have to go one step at a time in order to, you know, uh, stand scoot along you know the the side of the the table and then ultimately take those first steps and then pretty soon they're walking and or running and all holy terrors let loose on parents and life changes um empathy is very similar to that we're born with the, the ability to have empathy neuroscientists have found the the places in our brain that light up when we're experiencing empathy um but we need to practice it in order to, you know, it is like a muscle, just like those muscles in the legs. We have to keep practicing it in order to strengthen those muscles and, and keep them strong. And so as adults, what happens if you don't work out, um, you know, the muscles weaken, they atrophy. Um, and so you've got to constantly be, be using them and exercising them in order to keep them strong. So that's kind of the, the, answer to your team's question, I think you were also asking about my own personal experience. And I think the, the original spider bite turning me into Spider-Man, I suppose, happened in fifth grade when we had moved from one small town in Indiana to a smaller small town in Indiana. 
and um, going into to school. And the, the first town we lived in, life was great. I had a best friend. We used to role play all the time, you know, all the superheroes and, and female action heroes of the day of the 70s. So, you know, Charlie's Angels and Wonder Woman and Bionic Woman and all of that. And we had a great time. And no one told us what we were doing was wrong or that, you know, there was anything off about it. We were just being kids and, and having a great life. And then we got to this other town and I pretty quickly realized that the other kids weren't playing the same games that, that I was. And when I got into school, um, one of my classmates decided to spread the rumor that I was gay and 1980 i was in fifth grade um so you know context is everything so understanding 1980 a 12 year old isn't going to understand what gay is and what that's all about but the other students knew that 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 was something um that made me other and so that spread and that rumor spread like wildfire and i you know, didn't understand how to control it where empathy ultimately kicked in over the years was that i started to use that as my survival skill so i started to realize that people who know me and know more about me and possibly like me aren't going to participate in the rumors and then you know i'm not going to get threatened to be beaten up by somebody that knows me as a person so how do i get them to do that well i've got to actually pay attention to them and start having empathy with them and understand where they're coming from and so as you know elementary school turned into to middle school turned into high school i got better and better at using that uh skill and that strength to get along and hopefully then the goal was that if a rumor were to get started or somebody wanted to beat me up or something some of the kids weren't you know they, they weren't at least going to pile on um they'd remain neutral or you know hopefully even take my side at some point sometimes it's the things you know the tough things that make you stronger in some ways not underestimating the what you went through and i'm went through a breakdown myself, but it made me stronger for the work. To, to work your way through those things. I mean, you will come out stronger uh, on the other side. You just have to, it, it's, it's hard. Um, and, and you've got to have patience and resilience and, and do the things to, to get through it. But, um, but yeah, it, it does forge, you know, forge who we are and who we become. Mm. So, Talk to me about the five five steps, because I'm fascinated in those and we could dig in. And I think, you know, people listening are going to be, okay, so how do I do this empathy thing? Some people might be going, well, it's, you know, I do it. I feel like I do it. And other people might, well, okay. And the five steps are, are one of actually four sort of bigger pieces that people need to be mindful of. So, yeah, there are people out there that are saying, oh, yeah, empathy, I got this, or I, I think I'm already doing it. Well, you do have to have the self-awareness, first of all, to to be aware of your own behaviors and practices and, and are you getting to empathy and where are your thoughts coming from and how are you showing up? The second is to have courage um, to actually do this. This is not easy. And I think that's why many people default to just the sort of zero sum game winner takes all negative bashing that, that goes on. It's a lot easier. It's, it's kind of that old analogy, which some people have told me has been proven to be wrong, but that it takes more energy to smile than it does to frown takes more muscles to, to do that. But the thing is, when you do smile, you light up the room, you, you know, it changed the way people around you think and feel and, and having empathy and reflecting empathy is very similar to smiling in that regard. It, it lightens things up. It helps make a more cohesive society. It helps, you know, your individual interactions with people work better, but you've got to have the courage to do that. And then you've got to have the patience to practice the five steps, which I will come back to in a second, <laughs> um, because it is, it is a practice. And then finally, you've got to have grace and the grace is with yourself and recognizing that you're human and that we are prone to error. And what's important is that you have the courage to try and that you keep trying. Um, and if you don't get it right the first time, it's okay do, you know, try it again and, and try to, you know, try to improve. So those four kind of big meta things, the five steps themselves, 
The first one, and I'm just going to run through them uh, straight off, and then we can dive into whichever one you'd like to talk about more. But the first one is dismantling judgment. Uh, the second step is asking good questions. Third is actively listening, being present, paying attention. The fourth step is integrating into your understanding, making sense that making room in your head that other people have different points of views and different ways of, of being. And the fifth step is using your solution imagination. So that's as you're hearing things, as you're picking things up, sensing stuff, you're starting to, to put that back into the conversation so that you can further whatever it is that you're, you're doing where you are trying to build empathy. Um, so it, it's sort of the turning it back, folding it back onto itself. Nice. And I, I think the dismantling judgments piece, because we were talking about some stats that you have for leadership with empathy, um, which were fascinating before. And I think as a leader, I, I find myself, because I think I, I think I demonstrate empathy, but there's certain areas I don't. And as I was going through this, I, I was, as I was going through the book, I was saying, yeah, okay, I might feel like I am, but actually, am I practicing this on a daily basis? Am I leading with, you know, one of the things you had was looking for more gratitude and appreciation for things they have, but also appreciation being one of the, I've had to do a gratitude journal to be more grateful uh, in what I do. So I'd love to, to maybe to share the stats and maybe because some of it is about judgment in the head of the leader, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Judgment um, and dismantling judgment is the biggest and most challenging step for, for most people that are more educated and in sort of white collar jobs. And it, it's about, dismantling being judgmental because other things people are like, well, I've got to make judgments. I've got to make decisions and decisions are judgment. Yes, absolutely. Not saying to get rid of that. You have to make judgments. However, you don't have to be judgmental while you're doing it. Um, it, it being judgmental is casting aspersion. It's thinking negative, those negative thoughts or expressing them even about, you know, the, the kind of superficial thing, somebody's appearance, their skin tone, the, their accent, the way that they've presented themselves. Um, all of those things are being judgmental and you need to dismantle that. We're taught, however, you know, as I was saying, you've got to have an answer. If you are a leader, you've got to have the right sort of decision. And I think that, um, has crept in. We, we've had, you know, creep, if you would, into all parts of leadership, um, where instead it's like, well, yeah, you've got to make the decisions that are good for the business, but you also need to have empathy with your employees and, and understand where they're coming from and include that in your decisions. Ultimately, you know, 69% of CEOs believe it's their job to build empathy in the workplace. And they are absolutely correct. And this all comes from uh, Business Solvers State of Workplace Empathy study that came out uh, this year. It's an annual study that they do. So 69% believe it's their job to build empathy in the workplace. However, 79% of CEOs say they struggle to be empathetic. So it's like, hmm, I know I <laughs> need to do this, but even more people are like, I, I really have issues with this. I'm not sure how. And 77% of CEOs worry they will lose respect if they're too empathetic. So you, you, there's recognition, I need to do this. There's worry that they struggle. They're not really sure how they're not confident in their skills. They're out of shape. I mean, you know, the muscles aren't kind of fully formed. They know they need to do this exercise, but they're not sure how to, to do the deadlift without throwing their back out as kind of the equivalent. And they're afraid that they're going to be laughed at effectively. They're going to lose respect if they are too empathetic. When I'm doing leadership training, empathy and leadership training sessions, I start by asking people, like, tell me about a leader, business leader that you look up to. And the first time I did it, I was expecting I was going to hear Elon Musk and Jeff Bezos and Zuckerberg and, you know, all the to Steve Jobs, all the all the ones. Um, Jamie Dimon over at um, JP Morgan. Yeah. JP Morgan Chase. Yeah. And mm. so you thought I was going to hear all of that. And I didn't. Not a single person offered those leaders up as somebody that they look up to. Instead, they talked about a boss that they had had or a mentor. 
um, somebody that, and then it's like, okay, well, what did that person do? Why, why, what made them get on the list? And what they had, it was empathy. They listened to me. They, I felt supported by them. They took the time to get to know me and what my interests were and what was important to me. Um, so all of those things that, that is respect, you know, ultimately. So to those CEOs that are worried, they're going to lose respect. It's like, well, no, actually you're losing respect by not being empathetic. Interesting. So turn that sort of thought around. And it, it goes back to Meister's work on trusted advisor and trust equation where he talks about intimacy, you know, and he talks about the ability and people mistake that for, for about being nice, but actually the, his definition of intimacy is the ability to understand quickly. Yeah. You know, and to see from other people's perspectives and then make some decisions in there. So when you put it in an equation like that, which is research based, people go, oh, okay, so I've got to do this stuff to be trusted. But empathy is is a difficult piece because I, I I would I would say I'm probably one of those people that I wonder sometimes, particularly through the pandemic, empathy was everybody saying you got to have more empathy for your your team. Yeah, but uh, you know a lot of the times our number of our team were off. Yeah, they were on furlough. The people I was having empathy were the four of us who were senior leaders who were still working in there. So it's that balance of empathy, judgment, um, and also how other people react to be you being empathic as well. So, yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I think if you go back to Maslow's hierarchy, you know, of course we're going to worry about ourselves first, that's natural, but as you move up and evolve and advance, you start to think about others around you and, and have that focus. And, um, and yeah, the pandemic was really hard. Um, you know, and, and particularly as a leader, I mean, I have uh, 15 employees. So like yourself, it's like, oh gosh, how are they doing? But also worrying about myself and am I having my pandemic experience and you know, what are my feelings? And yeah. that's good and fine. You have to make sure you've got the outlet for that while well, you can also be there for your team and being able to kind of flip back and forth. Um, and so make sure that your needs are being met separately. Um, and it is not your team that is supposed to make you feel that way. That's not necessarily how that works. Um, but you do need to be there for that. In your book, you mentioned Brenny Brown's sympathy versus empathy. And I love that video that you, because there is a mistake sometimes from empathy piece where people will do sympathy, but there's some great taglines she's got in there that we all use. Yeah. But you've got this. Yeah. So do you want to share a bit about that? Because I, I love that concept. I liken it. Somebody else coined this, but I, I use it um, often where, you know, it's the difference between a three letter and a four letter word. Sympathy is feeling for somebody where empathy is feeling with somebody. Um, you need both and they have a place in society, but sympathy leads to power dynamics and power structure. And so in that awesome Brene Brown video where the elk is coming in or whatever, it's like, yeah, but at least you, you know, you could have children or at least you were, you were married, you know, and it, it's, it's belittling to the other person. There's that power structure that that's at play there. And it's not actually serving to comfort where if you approach it empathetically, which is seeing somebody's point of view, or trying to meet them as an equal on the same level um, playing field, if you would, then you're going to find that the other person's going to feel much more supported. And I think something that's really interesting, someone pointed out to me a couple months ago, and, and I'm now, of course, noticing it more and more. There's this response people have started to say, typically an empathetic response would be, I can imagine that was really difficult for you. Um, but now what people are saying, and it's a little bit more of a social media started thing. People are saying, I can't imagine what that was like. So <laughs> what that's doing and, and, and it's meant it with good intention of, you know, trying to support somebody. But what that's really saying is that f is making you very other, like you just had some freaky experience that I can't even imagine what that's like. You're on an Island all by yourself. Good luck you know, yeah. versus it's divisive. Yeah. 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 It, it pushes people away instead of the, I think the, I'm, I'm, I will 
you have unconditional positive regard for my fellow social media users that what they're really trying to say is, wow, that must have been really hard for you. And I'm, I'm really difficult uh, or I'm really sorry about that. And I'm here for you. Instead, they're going, yeah, that's that, that I can't even imagine that's beyond my comprehension. Um, what you just went through, um, you know, and, and they're, they're the empathetic way would be, I can imagine that was really difficult. Tell me more about that situation, you know, to ask the questions, to get somebody to, to share a bit more. Um, you know, it's, it's been fascinating before we hit record, uh, we were talking about loss and death and my having just recently lost my, my grandma, uh, and being present at that passing and you talk, sharing about your father. And I posted something on social media about it last week. Cause I, I needed to kind of let, I needed to let all my friends know that weren't, you know, in the immediate text chain of, of this had happened and the response I got, I mean, and this is, you know, for all the problems with social media, I think this is one area where social media does really well in allowing people to, to reach out. But I found, um, you know, and the responses you get back, May her memory be a blessing. I heard, got that out quite a lot, which is, is lovely. But when people were able to share a little bit more about themselves, one woman posted that she recently had to say goodbye to her grandma um, as well. And, and so I instantly knew we had, we were going through or she was going through something that I have just gone through and we were able to connect on that. And we were having an empathetic connection. So it wasn't just sympathy, putting a hand on my back saying, oh, I'm sorry for your loss, um, which is, is comforting. I don't want people to think you don't do that, but can you take it a step further and say, I, you know, it reminds me of when I lost so-and-so and, you know, th this was a difficult time and you did it very beautifully as you started to then share about your experience with your father passing. And we were able to, to have a nice connection uh, over that. And I felt supported. Good. Oh, well, thank you for that. Because I, I have a an imposter syndrome worry over that, which I'll, it is one of the thoughts is that I sometimes wonder by sharing my story, it diminishes the other person's story. So the empathy piece. And I wanted to explore the integrate into our understanding because there's sometimes another recent example, and I don't know how I'm linking this, but we were doing sarcasm on a board meeting. And one of the people on the boards uh, at the end of it, we were doing a debrief of the meeting said sarcasm. It's uh, about ripping flesh and visceral and I had a visceral reaction to it. And I was really quite strongly apologetic uh, on that and said, really sorry. Didn't, uh, you know, didn't mean for that to, to be there. And I consciously then went to my daughter and said this story. And she said, yeah, you're always sarcastic. But it's interesting that other people's version of that empathy is, is to not do it that time and wait till that person's not on the meeting and then do it. Yeah. So it's, there's two things. One is sharing your own stories and whether it diminishes because Brenny Brown is very keen for us to go down and say, I've been in this dark place before. And now that comes across. And then the second piece is this other bit, which is it's empathy for the moment until that person's passed and then consistency of behavior with other people. With that, just love to explore that with you. Yeah. I mean, first I didn't feel, I, I never once had the thought like, Oh God, Colin, you're making this all about yourself. Um, when we were having that conversation, it wasn't, it was a very nice, you know, you held space for me, let me share. And then you started to share and I felt, a connection. Then, then we talked about different, you know, aspects of the grieving process or the, the funeral process versus, you know, funeral versus memorial or celebration of life. And I thought that was all very organic and, and natural. So, um, I, I never once thought, gosh, there's some megalomaniac making it all about him. Good. <laughs> I have seen others though. Um, I will protect the, <laughs> Well, I'll, I actually know. I'm just going to tell you um, a family member. Uh, yeah. I won't name the family member, but a relative on the my other side of the family reached out um, with condolences, wrote you know, a lot of memories about um, my grandma, which was very lovely um, and nice. And then 
I replied back, you know, so sent that, I don't know, the day before the funeral or something the day after the funeral. And I'm at that point, you know, it's like hundreds of work emails plus personal plus whatever. And I just replied back. I said, thank you so much for sharing those memories. I really appreciate it. You know, she lived a remarkable life, whatever. I got an email yesterday then. So like three days later going, I don't want to overinterpret the brevity of your reply. Huh. However, I noticed that you didn't put my first name in the start of your email, nor did you sign it. Wow. And yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is an example of narcissism and making it about you versus going like, like not even thinking twice about it. Um, so that's one kind of example on the, the reply where they're making it suddenly about them instead of just saying, like not even thinking about it going like you're busy, you're upset, you're processing quite a lot. I can imagine that I'm, I'm just here for you. How can I help you? Is there anything I can do for you? Um, so that's one kind of example in that situation that just happened. And then, you know, on a, on a, uh, day to day sort of basis, you know, you can tell by somebody's reaction, whether they're how engaged they are in their eyes and, and everything. And I think, you know, are you at the, the I guess, editor, editor question I would be asking myself. And I, I get it because I've offered condolences on pets and family members and all of that. But, you know, it's like, to what end am I, I sharing this? Is this about, you know, and how, how much time am I taking up or how much copy is being dedicated to them versus, Oh, and let me tell you about my story. Um, you know, and, and instead it's like kind of a loss of the pet. I'm, you know, terribly sorry about Fido's passing. And it sounds like you have amazing memories. I remember the huge hole that was left in my heart when our cat bullet died suddenly after surgery. Don't need to go on and tell you about the cat and all the things in that moment, but I'm at least saying like a little more about like I've been there um, and I've had that, but it's really still about you and your, your pet, because ultimately it is about that person, but you do, you, you know, it, I, I believe it is helpful to share a little bit as Brene Brown is saying, like, let people know that, that you've been there, but just let them know. <laughs> that you've been there. Don't make it about you. Don't that this isn't your therapy session. You know, it, it's about supporting the other person. Um, and yeah, uh, um, try to try to offer it from a place of support. I do think you're talking about something here, which is because the, the language I would use is there's habits that you can deploy. And one of those habits is being too, truly present. Yeah. You know, when you are, it's that conscious thing about switching off or conscious of when it's not the right time to reply to something. Cause there's times where I'll just do my sister would accuse me occasionally of writing an email or a text to her. And I, my normal sign off in emails is cheers. Yeah. You know? Uh -huh. And I always remember giving the feedback saying, you've done a cheers to me. I'm your sister. You know, I deserve a bit of love or a kiss or something like that. But there is something about being in the right mind. <laughs> kind of regard. Yeah. Yours sincerely, your brother. Right. Um, right. But there is something about being present. And, and I, I think that's one thing that's, that's going through my mind. But it's also something that a friend of mine gave me. He said, Colin, you need to be careful. And careful was like, what? I don't like careful. I want to be risky. And she said, no, you've got to be full of care. And I just, that, that story about Fido you used there was a neighbor, my dog passed away and he knew how I love my dog. And he wrote me a handwritten letter that he posted through just saying, so sorry to buy jazz, know how much you loved her, blah, 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 blah. And just did exactly that, that piece. And firstly, it was the message, but secondly, he'd handwritten it. Um, and that empathy was huge for me. So yeah, that is exactly, brilliant. exactly. And maybe he even added in, you know, I could see the bond between the two of you when you'd be in the backyard doing whatever, you know, making stuff up, but reflecting on how it was evident, how you, you felt about each other and the, the loss then that obviously must be left from that. Um, yeah. yeah. And, and, even within, I love careful. Um, 
I, I love that. And I think as you were also talking about that, I think about the five steps. It's really that actively listening. It's about being present um, and paying attention and using care um, and, and paying attention to all the different signals that are coming through and, and not worrying about your laundry list of things to do or looking at your phone or, you know, whatever the slack is coming in, like laptops closed eyes, you know, eyes forward, pay attention, listen to what's being said. And I think you can always spot when somebody's not doing that. I always used to be able to tell when my daughters were watching TV when I rang home. Yeah, you could hear in the voice, what are you watching? Oh, I'm watching blah, blah, blah. I said, okay, so why aren't you talking to me? You know, the empathy was was missing out of that. I'm, I'm fascinated moving into the last two steps because I'd love your interpretation of them. So integrate into understanding. I'd love you to give some examples about how you do that because the first three for me, dismantle judgment, tough, ask good questions, tough, but okay yep. and then active listening i get but the last two for me are the, the the real icing on the cake yeah yeah well um the i'll give you with integrating to understanding i'll give you the kind of easy explanation um where i'll i'll often ask people like what what's your favorite flavor of ice cream and they'll say, you know, whatever. I don't know, Colin, what's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Uh, it would be vanilla, actually, bizarrely. <laughs> yeah, vanilla. <laughs> okay, yours is vanilla. Well, I love chocolate and I'm all, and I genuinely love any, any chocolate ice cream. Now, imagine if you and I were going to go down to the ice cream shop and we only had money for one scoop and one flavor. How would we use that to, to figure out what? flavor to get. We would end up asking questions of each other, trying to build empathy, understanding where you're coming from rather than going, ew, you like chocolate. That's weird. Um, it's making room in your head that like, Hey, I like vanilla, but other people like chocolate. Some people like pistachio. That's okay. There's different ways of viewing the world and moving through the world. If we hope to reach a compromise or a decision together on what flavor of ice cream we want to get, we're going to have to talk about it and talk through it. And well, what is it that you like about vanilla or chocolate? And you know, maybe even what don't you like about the other flavor? Because maybe it's a soft serve place where they could do a swirl of the two and then we're both happy. Um, you eat one side and I eat the other and it's all good. Um, but you have to have those conversations and you have to make room in your head that there are opportunities um, and, and different ways of, of viewing the world back to grandma. Um, and, and another incident that happened at the lunch following her funeral. So it was Italian Catholic, New York wedding or funeral. So there was a wake one day and then we had all the different steps and it always finishes with a meal. Um, you know, it's, it's, that's family. That's what you do. And at the table that my husband and I were sitting at were a, a uh, a cousin and his wife and they're old. They're my parents' generation. So they're in their late sixties and, um, live in a more conservative part of the country. And he asked, he's like, I just, I, I, he's like, I'm not sure how to ask this, but like Nancy Pelosi, why should I vote for her? Why should I support? He's like, I'm an independent. Why should I go down, you know, this other side? And, um, it, uh, I appreciated that he asked the question. My husband and one of our friends that was there were a little more like rough um, and, and put off by the fact that he even introduced it. But I was like, Hey, as long as the question is getting asked and it gave me the opportunity to then share and talk about um, from our perspective as a gay couple, why it's important for us that, individual freedoms and rights are protected. And I, you know, I asked him at one point, you know, he's a straight man. He's been married for 40 years at this point. I said, can you imagine what it's like, to, what it would be like to have somebody tell you that your marriage doesn't count and isn't viewed as equal, you just has no right to be and in, in, in equal. And he couldn't initially. And I was like, okay, well, imagine that that's actually the case. That's the what we're facing. And that's something that, that we're concerned about. So 
you know, it's, it's not that he's wrong necessarily on the issues, but it's making room in my head that he's got a different point of view and different priorities. And so how do I talk with him and ask good questions and listen to him while making room in my head that he has a right to believe what he believes. Um, but if I want to try to get him as an independent to possibly vote Democrat, or at least understand where I'm coming from and why I'm casting the vote that I am, um, I need to, to be okay with where he's at, but instead work with him and share where I'm coming from so that hopefully he'll be open and understand that as well. But it's all about making room in your head that like people don't show up or don't have the same belief systems. They, they, they have very different, uh, uh, different beliefs and behaviors and, and it's okay. We need to talk about it though. And we, in order to do that, we've got to be open and listen and make room in our head that, Oh, okay. Somebody likes vanilla ice cream. I think that's weird, but okay. We can Let's go, go with it. Yeah. yeah. It's interesting. One of my uh, New Zealand friends gave me the expression said, uh, a lot of people say, so I'm going to dance with the music. The other person brings rather than dance the music I'm bringing into it. And I used to, I love that expression because if I learn to dance with the music, the other person's bringing and take them along, then hopefully they'll see my side as well and, uh, and work. And then we can dance to, you know, a different music in the future. But I, I love that story because it's, it's not always about the chocolate or the vanilla. It could be about another flavor, which is let's, let's get one we both like. So yeah, love that. Yeah. Yeah. So thank you. Let's end on the use solution imagination then, because this is coming into something that I struggle with. So I've got all of this, you know, I've integrated in my understanding. Um, a lot of us struggle to do this. So what? Yeah. Right. The so what? So, and the, the stories that I chose to, to use in the book to illustrate that point are examples where I was in situations, um, where suddenly things were like clicking. I was like, Oh, okay. <laughs> so, and one of, one of my favorite, um, stories, uh, and there's a chapter called what are you willing to sacrifice? And we were in Toronto talking with immigrants to Canada. Um, and the immigrant experience in Canada and acclimation and how all of that works. And the client was general mills. So it was a food study, but before you get to the food, you've got to understand the context and who the person is and what they're all about and what their journey was. So in the, the chapter, I don't want to give all of it away, but, um, in the chapter, the, the, there was a South Asian couple, they were from India, um, and they'd been in Toronto for, I think, seven or eight years at that point. And, um, the wife was telling me how she had a job she, earlier. She had told, uh, acknowledged that they were Hindi and so they didn't eat meat, but then she went on and she was telling me about from a work perspective, she was a teacher back in India, but skills, you know, the certifications don't transfer. So she got a job at Burger King. And her first job was working on the line. Wow. Yeah. And I was like, hmm, okay. <laughs> so what's that like working, you know, you're Hindu, the cow I know is a sacred symbol yeah. in the religion. And here you are flame broiling it. How do you reconcile that? How does, how does all of that work? And so I, that this is using solution imagination. What I just did there is I took all the different pieces of information that I had and I started to string it all together and go, you know, my, my intuition was telling me this was probably very difficult for her because I was in research. I needed to get her to talk about it and, and I had to ask, I couldn't just surmise. So I asked the question, what was that like, um, for you? because I, I know all those things. So I'm using solution imagination. I can imagine this was difficult. What was that like? Another story um, in another chapter called leave your boots at the door. I was looking at working class Americans and um, was really struck by the values in working class America. <laughs> you know, cause here we are, it's eight o'clock at night. We're all white collar workers making, you know, cushy, comfortable salaries. But when that interview is over, I'm going back to my hotel room. I'm going to be working on email till midnight and go, 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 where the people we were talking to, they were like, oh yeah, you know, 
leave leave my boots at the door. Like mm. work does not come home. And yeah. It was like, well, what's that like? What's that feel like? Um, and would they actually want to, you know, would they want that experience for themselves? Would they want to have a white collar job and, and all the things? And so I, I asked, like, if we could double your salary or if you could have one of those jobs, make six figures, what would that be like? And the answer was really profound, um, kind of gave me an existential crisis in the middle of a, a research project. Um, but those are all examples of using solution imagination where, as I was saying earlier, it's like about folding back over on itself. I'm taking all the things that I've learned and now I'm using it to further the conversation to, to get closer to a place of empathy. Love that. And it's also helpful in terms of the coaching analogy that you're refolding it, you're putting it back to them because a lot of the times we don't see our patterns in life and the existential crisis for you at that point is, is one that's folded back and went, well, yeah, why do I do that? Why do I, why would do I like want- a job that's, you know, leave your boots at the door type of approach? Right, yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, and maybe I'll be happier pulling shots at Starbucks. I don't know. Well, on the a note of empathy, cause I've always said that if, if I didn't do this and I had to do a job, then a barista or a barman, one of the two would be where, so I could chat and I could talk to people of the things. So we've got a common thing in there in, in terms of st- Starbucks. Uh, Rob, it's been an absolute delight to talk to you to, today, sir. Thank you for taking the time. I always end with a, a question, um, which is if you had to, to pick one of the, the failures or the mistakes in your past that's been your biggest teacher or learning point for you, what would it be? Yeah, well, uh, being a seven on the Enneagram, uh, which means I'm the adventurer and the optimist, I don't reflect too often on the past. Um, but biggest mistakes that I made that have been big teachers, I think the one that's coming up for me that I'll just go with um, back in 1999, um, cause I am old enough to have been working back then. My, I got laid off from a job and it worked out nicely because a friend and I were plotting to go out on our own. We were in our early thirties and start our own little consulting firm. And so, you know, great. Yay. I got $5,000 severance and I'm going to like, let's, let's go. Um, and so we started doing that and it, taught me, I was working you know, remotely from home, um, back at, at the time. Um, but I it ultimately didn't work. Um, cause Volpe LaMontagne communications is no more. And now I've got a nine three sixty and all of that, but it taught me about, um, what I was really looking for, what I was interested in, but also the importance of wisdom. Um, I was doing that. We were too young, um, you know, and, and no offense to anybody that's at that age that, that is going out on their own, but for me to provide consulting services, I just didn't, we didn't, I didn't have all of the pieces that I needed. And then, you know, 10 years later, um, opportunity presented itself in a different form and I was able to move into that in a very different way. So I would say that that's one failure that, uh, I've definitely learned from and draw from consistent with my own wish was teaching coaching when I'd never been really a fundamental leader in my life and people where I was teaching and then my client still doesn't forgive me about the fact that I didn't tell anybody that but taught them coaching so it's about seven years later after a few drinks I shared that and uh, she still pokes me in the ribs every time I, uh, I tell her that. So yeah, I'm with you. <laughs> you read it. You read all the books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I did. You know, I could tap dance up front, so surely I can do this. Yeah. But yeah, it's right, uh, right. practice leadership now. Yeah. If, if people want to find you, sir, where would they go? Where would they? Yeah. Uh, I would love for them to find me um, on LinkedIn, uh, Rob Volpe. If you type in empathy activist on any of the social channels, I will show up. Um, and whether that's, uh, you know, Instagram, uh, Twitter, TikTok, Peloton, the, I, I am there. Uh, you can also visit <laughs> uh, the company website, ignite-360.com or the website for the book, which is fi- the number five steps to empathy.com. Rob, 
delighted. I loved the book, um, loved our conversation, and uh, I hope to to further and you know have another conversation in the future at some point as we we progress this. So lovely to speak to you. I would love that. Thank you so much. This has been delightful. Excellent conversation with Rob. It's one of those easy conversations. I sometimes feel when I'm in a conversation like that, that it's, it might be an echo chamber because he and I are on the same path about empathy. But I think what I love about here, uh, the conversation I've just had with Rob is that it's a chance for me to reflect on my own empathy and how much I demonstrate it. And there's also a chance to, to share stories about what empathy looks like, empathy versus sympathy. But I also love the data because the data and that 70% of leaders who um, worry about losing respect if they're too empathic is, for me, is or empathetic, is, is a key stat that we need to think about. And a lot of my coaching is around we need to be tough and the stereotypes of leadership that we have out there that I think empathy can can change and be a core ingredient in terms of the mix that we start to see a different version of leadership in society. So. Thank you. Look forward to welcoming another episode of the Leadership Tales podcast very soon.